Welcome to first. So many people dwell on the last of something, or the thing that's coming next. But when something happens for the first time, it's special. Well, firsts aren't always happy occasions, that memorable, or in hindsight, that important. Our firsts shape us, shape the decisions we make and the relationships that we have. First, it's about all of those moments. The memories that will stay with us forever and those that will eventually fade. Good, bad, best, worst. The first of something is always so important. You're here to share in our firsts. Who knows what else this will start for you. Mum had been in the hospital for a few days and Dad hadn't told me a lot. I was in the living room watching cartoons when Dad came in and asked me to sit on the sofa. I knew that I was having a baby, but I wasn't crazy about the idea of sharing my parents, or my toys, or the spotlight. Dad sat me down and asked if I remembered that we were having a new family member. I vividly recall rolling my eyes. Of course I remembered. I was dreading it. Dad was crouched next to me with the biggest smile I've ever seen on his face, telling me how I had a little brother. I shrugged when he asked whether I wanted to meet him. Mum walked in holding a tiny little baby with loads of blue blankets around him with an even bigger smile on her face. It looked weird that she didn't have a big belly anymore after so many months of seeing it get bigger and bigger. Mum passed him to me and taught me how to carry him. She kept telling me to be careful and be gentle but he was really light so I knew he'd be fine. He was really warm. I remember feeling my arms getting hotter but Maybe it was just the blankets. I knew the idea of a little brother wasn't my favourite thing in the world. But I couldn't help but smile along with mum and dad. I had this weird feeling of closeness, even though I'd just met him. Mum had ignored my suggestion of purple as a name, which I thought was unfair, because they said he was my little brother and purple was my favourite colour. But I can look back now and see that Luke was a much better name for him. He started crying and I shoved him back into Mum's arms. I jumped down from the sofa and turned the volume all the way up on the TV to drown him out. Mum and Dad left me alone to watch cartoons. I love Luke. He did end up stealing some attention, and my toys, and he can be an annoying little shit a lot of the time. But I'll always look out for him. When people bullied him at school, when he cried after his first girlfriend dumped him, when he needed help during his GCSEs. We argue a lot, but I can't look at him and not feel the same way I did on the day that I met him. Protective. Okay, so my first cigarette was behind the bike sheds at school. And Alex said if I didn't smoke, I wasn't cool. So I did, and I coughed so hard that I thought I was gonna throw up. <laughs> yeah, Alex was a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for God's sake. That's all I said. Oh, for God's sake. That's it. We were in geography and everyone was talking. I mean, everyone. It just so happened that I was turned around to talk to Lauren and Miss Clark decides to call me out for talking. So I turned around and in my moody 14 year old sultry way said, what? Well, that just set her off on a tirade of pointless anger about how I was wasting everybody's time. One, this is geography. No one cares about geography. I'm not wasting anybody's time. Fact. Two, you're the one wasting everybody's time by having a go at me. So I turned round and muttered, oh for God's sake. That just set her off even more. The next thing I know, I'm being sent out of the lesson with a pink detention slip for my use of bad language. My first thought, I had no idea Miss Clark was such a Jesus freak. Turns out she's not. She thought I said, oh, for fuck's sake. Even after arguing the point for like 
20 minutes. She refused to believe I'd only said God. I'd been sent out of lessons loads of times for being cheeky or whatever, but this was too far. I do not get detentions. Well, I didn't. Got a few more after that. I had to stay behind for an hour after school to write a letter of apology to the deaf bitch for my use of bad language. My first detention was for something that I didn't even say. Wish I fucking had now. <laughs> <laughs> I did learn something from my first detention though. If you're going to be rude to a teacher, enunciate. <laughs> talking about that shitty year eight thing where you're passing notes and you're holding hands. No! I'm talking about actually legitimately getting jumped. So come on, hands up, right? Anyone without a hand up, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off, come on. <laughs> so, Charlie and me were only together for ten months. Now, I know that doesn't seem like a long time to you guys, but, you know, we were in love. You know, spent all our time together, like the same films, like the same food, you know, thought we were in love. <sighs> like my heart broke when Charlie broke up with me. You know, it was like my brain couldn't deal with it, so the rest of my body just shut down. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say that I cried, you know, when it happened. And then like, the next day, and the next week, and uh, a month afterwards. Okay, I cried a lot. First time I got dumped. <laughs> you know, I had to rebuild my own self-worth and get used to sleeping alone and just pretend like it didn't rip my heart in two when I saw Charlie and my best friend parading off together. Just... <clears throat> Some people would say it's silly, but I remember every detail of my first kiss. We used to walk home from school together every day. He just wanted to make sure that I was okay, you know? And we'd end up on the same corner of the same road. Wellfield Road. A few weeks before, he told me that he had feelings for me. I mean, at first I was a little bit surprised, but it was actually the single best thing he could have said. Funnily enough, I had feelings for him when I first met him back in March. And when I told him this, we just bashfully laughed at each other. I mean, just think of it, the irony that the two best friends were both falling for each other. It, it kind of reminded me of a joke we used to share, that the urge to act upon it was like the fish going for the bait of the fisherman. And that if we acted upon it, it would just fuck up the friendship and blah, 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 blah. So, cut to the day. We're walking home from school, end up on Wellfield Road. And normally we'd just stand around for an hour. Nothing weird would happen, just, you know, family chit-chat. But today he didn't say anything. I don't know what it was, but there was this just urge inside me, you know. I just, I couldn't help him. I just had to grab his arm and just throw myself into his shoulders. At first I thought he'd be shocked, but again, he just laughed. Then... He brushed his fringe away from his eyes and pushed me into the lamppost. <laughs> I won't go into details, but uh, needless to say, he's a great kisser. Then, for a couple more minutes, we just stood looking at each other. Then, all of a sudden, fire truck comes past, lights blaring, drawing all the attention away from the two boys in each other's arms. Then he just turned around and Shut it away. Like I said, every detail. It's not like death was something that I didn't understand. I'd seen enough TV and I'd watched enough films to know that 
it's sad when someone dies. And when I was five, my granddad died of cancer. Didn't really know too much about it. I was just told that he had a disease and had fallen asleep. My mum and dad thought that I was a little bit too young to be going to a funeral. Now, I was sad, but not really that upset. And I know that sounds bad, but I was upset for my mum more than anything because she was really close to him. But to me, he was just nice granddad. Occasionally played dominoes with me and was just always there with a word that's original up his sleeve. But when Jason died, I feel like that was the first time where death really started to mean something to me. You see, Jason was, he was my best friend and his funeral would have been the first one that I ever went to. It felt so weird just waking up in the morning, turning off my alarm, but not getting ready for school. Because usually I'd just be able to have a lay-in and think about all the TV I could watch or all the Xbox games I could play. Either that or I'd message Jason and see if I wanted to go out. So I put on this formal black suit, which it just, it didn't feel right with it being so formal, but it's what had to be done at the end of the day. And I just remember when I came downstairs, my mum and dad were practically silent. You see, they had no idea how to comfort me, so instead they just had to let me get on with it. I mean, she offered to drive me up to Jason's, I guess, but I insisted that I wanted to walk because it was a walk I'd done near enough every single day for the past five years. And besides, I really didn't want Mum seeing me cry. And usually it only takes about ten minutes, but this time it took on near on half an hour and by the time I got there I was trained in this haze. It was like I'd just lingered there on autopilot. But I still haven't cried though. Not even when I passed the corner shop where me and Jason had sometimes fed grown-ups to buy his pack of fags when we were 12 years old. But when I got there, I can't even remember the last time that I'd knocked on their door without just walking straight in, but this didn't feel like it was one of those times. His sister Ellie answered the door and I could, I could barely recognise her. She was in this black dress that was way more formal than anything I ever thought that she'd own and her eyes were just swollen up with redness and tears. She pulled me in, swept me into quite possibly the tightest hug that I think I've ever had. And I just remember thinking to myself, I don't think I'd ever hugged Ellie before then. And his mum, Mel, was just frantically running about the kitchen, trying to make all of the arrangements for the wake, trying to worry, like, just worrying about food, flowers, and all of the relatives. But even she broke away, gave me a hug, and commented on how smart I looked. I don't think I'd actually hugged Mel before then, either. Come to think of it, I think I only hugged Jason, maybe twice in the years that we were friends. 
but I just remember looking around, seeing all of the flowers plastered all over the room and just thinking to myself, Jason, we fucking hated this. See, he had really bad hay fever. And he wouldn't have been able to stop sneezing in his own house. Part of me wanted to share the irony with Ellie or laugh at the thought of one of his tantrums. But I just, I couldn't speak. I was just there, being in his house. As we drove towards the church, I just remember thinking, as we all sat in silence for what felt like an eternity, thank God I'm facing the other way, because I don't think I would have been able to look at his coffin for that long. We finally get to the church and make some fake smiles at all the people who were just telling me how sorry they were. And then finally, they bring in his coffin and I was forced to look and I broke. You see, after days of trying to convince myself that this wasn't real, hours of just pretending, I saw that coffin and I knew that Jason was inside and I just fucking burst into tears. Poor, poor Mel couldn't even finish her poem and had, a, had to get Ellie to do it for her. And the priest said something too, but I just remember thinking to myself how much Jason wouldn't have listened. Because Jason wasn't, he wasn't big on religion. And it was clear that this church knew nothing about him. You see, Jason was funny. Jason was clever and he was loyal. But if you pissed him off, you knew about it. <laughs> he was loud, he was blunt, some would even say rude. But he was confident. Confident in his advice that he'd give to his friends, confident in telling you exactly what he thought. The irony is that in great of speaking at a funeral. And then his voice just echoed inside my head and I thought about all of the times where he wasn't shy of standing up in a room full of people and just saying what he wanted to say. But this wasn't going to be one of those times. You see, Jason never would have got the chance to speak at somebody's funeral. Jason never would have got the chance to go to uni with me. Fuck, he'd never even get to find out his GCSE results. He was gone. As the service ended and his coffin disappeared behind the black curtain. I realised that that was the last chance that I'd ever get to make a new memory of Jason. So I'll always have years of memories of us chatting absolute shit and sleepovers and wandering aimlessly around town. But now I had two very clear memories. The 
day when I was 15. Watched him get hit by a car and sat with him as he died in the street. And the day I said goodbye to him. The day I went to my first funeral. I've always loved dressing up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Ever since I was little, I rarely left the house not in some sort of fancy dress. But everybody else always had better things, though. Especially the girls. They always had fairy wings and Disney princess dresses and those little plastic high heels with fairy fur on the strap. <laughs> so, didn't take much twisting my arm when my friend asked me if she could put me in drag. <laughs> you see, it probably felt like I wasn't really that into it. You know, it was just the nerves though, you know, just trying to contain myself from screaming, yes! <laughs> <laughs> you see, I always loved the idea of being a drag queen. Ever since I watched the first episode of the greatest TV show of all time, RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since I'd walk into Boots, I'd find myself just staring at an array of lipsticks, eyeliners, contour kits and mascaras and God knows what else that was just too expensive for me. And of course, every time I'd gone on a night out, I'd find myself sinking into a sea of plaid shirts and skinny jeans and guys ignoring me. But when I felt that first Wipe of the eyeliner across my waterline. Oh fucking hell, the rush that just went through me! <laughs> <sighs> my friend just mercilessly contoured my face, just beating it everywhere with this horrible shadow palette, which I think had some kind of shimmer in it. And I learnt also how to put lipstick on my teeth without getting it on my lipstick on my lips rather, without getting it on my teeth. But at the end of the day, it has to be said, I did look like shit. <laughs> but honey, what baby drag queen doesn't? <sighs> Cut to an hour later, we're on our way into town and <sighs> I felt phenomenal. I mean, yes, I'm wearing a pair of high heels that's three sizes too small for me, with my toes hanging over the edge. I'm now wearing a bra that's just too small for me, my chest is just a bit too big for it. And of course, I'm wearing a dress showing off the haphazard attempt at me shaving my legs. Cuts and scars everywhere. But I just didn't care. That is until I started noticing all the people looking at me. I mean, they weren't looking at me in a good way, sort of in a repulsive way. I think a lot of people just couldn't handle the idea of the man in the dress. And I had three old ladies come up to me and tell me that I was a freak, which I just found hilarious, because they were fucking munters. <laughs> <laughs> The point is, people, that I am a drag queen. I bend the rules, I shake things up. I, I mean, it's not something I do every day. It's a tiring and an expensive sport, I'll have you know. But when a ruby slippers pots on her high heels, takes to the stage, or even just a night out, she feels loved, accepted, and free. She feels like she could take over the world. was Charlie in the Chocolate. You read it. Okay, it's really great. Um, so it's about this boy, and it's Paul. You know, I just watched the film. Um, but like the old one, not that new shit one with Johnny Depp. Um, yeah, it's the first book I read, all by myself. And you know, it was a bit tricky, like some of the words were a bit weird, like I had to sound out that one's like, scrum diddly up shoes, or whatever it was, but I did it. So the thing is, um, most kids will read a book by themselves when they're like seven. Um, yeah, I was six. T 
teen. Uh, like, like reading is just really hard for me. Um, like all the words just kind of jumble together, and it's just, it's just a bit tricky for me. Like, well, not dumb, like really clever. It's just, yeah. And I don't really tell my friends because you know they just sort of laugh at me, and you know, then tell the teachers because they just be like, oh, let us help you through it. And, I told the lady at the library though, she was proud of me, you know, not for telling her that I struggled, but because I did it, you know, she even pointed out some more books that I could read, you know, some point I'll get onto like those fancy books by like uh, Charles Dickens and Emily Brunt, whatever the names, um, like reading's still really hard, but, you know, I enjoy it. period was fairly early. <laughs> Thought I was dying. Ran crying to my dad who didn't have a clue what to say. Luckily my aunt Lynn was on hand for a girls chat. Like everybody has at some point. I promised that I would never ever ever drink again. Absolute bolts of course but I was serious at the time. I had that odd small glass of wine with Sunday dinners before. But this was the first time I got absolutely plastered. Rather embarrassingly. It was on a crate of 12 blue WKDs in a play park with my friends. I could barely stand up, spewed blue sick all over the place and God knows what else. I have no recollection of getting home, but Dad found me in the garden in the morning. Who knows what could have happened, or what did happen. I promised I would never ever drink again, which I broke not too long afterwards. But I did promise never to get that drink again, where I was out of control and putting my life in danger. Getting drunk is a lot of fun, until it's not. It's Christmas! Are you Let me tell you guys about the first Christmas dinner that I ever cooked. Whew. It was a fucking disaster. <laughs> now, I'd only lived in England for about three months at the time, and I couldn't afford to take the time off work to go home. My mum was gutted, but I refused to let her pay for my travel. It was you know, exciting, the thought of having Christmas on my own. My girlfriend and her older sister, Claire, they were coming up to visit and I said that I'd cook. Now, I'm not a bad cook. I can prove it if I ever get the chance to make you a lasagna. <laughs> but this, went wrong on epic proportions. I mistimed everything. The turkey was dry, the potatoes were overcooked and just sort of fell apart, and the stuffing mix. I don't quite know how I managed to pause up stuffing mix, put it in a pan, and then just add in some water. But hey, I managed it. The sole thing that survived the kitchen apocalypse were these vile vegetarian pigs in blankets that I bought for m and For Claire. <laughs> <laughs> By the time they got there, I was hot, sweaty, and dishevelled. Sexy, right? <laughs> yeah, they left too. <laughs> and thus began uh, the start of a new Christmas tradition. Not the 
Trevester's attempt at cooking for myself. Not the ordering of Chinese food. But now, I order everything from M&S. <laughs> everything. <laughs> this year they even gave me a list with all of the timings, when to put it exactly in the oven, on the baking tray, or in the microwave. The veggie pigs in blankets don't make an appearance anymore though, do they? <sighs> Fuck you, Claire! <laughs> Eh, shit. <laughs> Just like you stupid sister. <laughs> so, this guy's been an absolute fucking bell end. <laughs> I've never been in a fight before, and I never hit someone that wasn't just a playful little tap. <laughs> I got a little, co a couple of couple of hits in there. <laughs> but my first fight ended up with me flat on my back, broken nose, and a very bruised ego. <laughs> I was furious with myself. I'm always so bloody careful when it comes to my pill. But, lo and behold, there I was at 18. Pregnant. I'd only just come to uni and it was hard enough with Sam living that far away. The baby wasn't going to be good for me. But slowly, I got used to the idea. Started looking at baby clothes on Pinterest. Told my mum and she said I didn't need to worry about money. Even picked out a name for both genders. But it never got to that point. 12 days before my first scan, I woke up bleeding. It was the worst pain I've ever felt. My first pregnancy ended in miscarriage. And what hurts the most is that I didn't get to know anything about my baby. I don't know it, it was a boy or a girl. And just as I was getting used to the idea of being a mum, I wasn't. I wasn't a mum. I was just a very, very upset 18-year-old girl with a lot of Pinterest pages to unfollow. Yeah, you know what, I've got quite a few tattoos actually, but my first one, that'll always be my favourite. See, I knew I wanted one, but I didn't really know what I wanted to get. And I heard in that instance you're supposed to go for rose, skull, or an anchor. Now, I'm not really the rose or skull type. And I can't really get an anchor because my dad's in the army and he'd probably fucking kill me. But, uh, you know, I went for the equally eye-rolling cliche of Chinese writing <laughs> on my lower back. And it hurt like a bitch. And I cried like a little bitch too. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it doesn't say, uh, determination, like I asked the bastard to give me. It says, insert here. 
You know what? I still love it. It reminds me of how much of a twat I was when I was 18. You know what, I guess it makes the one with Ugly Betty on my arm seem a little bit less stupid. You know, for the first six months of his life, all I saw of my son were photographs. I'm ashamed to say I took the cow's way out, ran away when my girlfriend told me she was pregnant. I haven't got an excuse. Scared. Stupid. So stupid, I couldn't even remember to wear a fucking Johnny. I wasn't the right person to be bringing up a kid. I mean, obviously I regret it. God knows how many times I've heard people say how important it is to be there when your child is born. Yeah, well I missed that. I didn't meet my son until May 9th. One day, I'm watching one one every minute in an attempt to procrastinate from exam revision. And it just makes me realise how much of a dick I was. So, we go on Facebook, find one of Michaela's friends and see if I can get a number. Having moved 140 miles away to uni and having had 12 months of silence from me, you can imagine the response that I got from her. Weirdly, she Gave me a number anyway. So, phone number Kayla. I get a similar response. Showering, swearing. Which, she doesn't tell her to. I mean, I have no reason to justify my absence. After a very long, drawn out conversation, she eventually said I could meet him. She made it crystal clear we weren't going to get back together, but she invited me over to her house. So, a few weeks go by, pass my exams, and I get the train down. You know, things like this just put everything into perspective. You know, uni and exams and all that shit just didn't matter anymore. All I cared about was just me and my little boy, you know? It's funny, like, going to the house that day, like, when I was with Michaela still, I used to go there all the time. I mean, it got to a point where I could just knock on the door as I was walking in. Fucking hell, I didn't do that this day. God, I had a lot a groveling to do. So, I pluck up the courage, knock, and who else answers but Michaela's mum, Kim. She planted her arm this way, so I couldn't go in. Well, she said. <laughs> there was a whole lot of silence after that. I thought I should break it with... Hi, Kim. Fucking hell. Shouting, the swearing, pointing a finger at me. How dare I be so casual? Michaela finally comes along, just pulls her off of me. Like, it's okay. No, I've told him off. He's here to make things right. God, they're so similar to each other. Walk on in. Kim goes upstairs to get Connor. And I decide to give Michaela the most awkward hug anyone has ever given anyone. I was so tense about everything. But, after about two minutes, Kim walks downstairs, and there he is, my son, with a very bemused look on his face. I instantly relaxed after that. I reached out to grab him, even though Kim muttered under her breath out, I'm a stranger, he might cry with me. Well, he did it, Kim! Actually, what he did, was curl his fingers into my hoodie and look straight at me into my eyes. God, he had Michaela's eyes. It's all this beautiful, like, powder blue. It's just so bright, you know? And his hair was, like, bright white, just like mine when I was that little. <laughs> I, I couldn't stop smiling. Like, I actually... I couldn't put it into words just how happy I was that day. Just to be holding my son. I just clutched him closer to me, breathing in and out. It just made me realise how much of a fucking... I've got to stop thinking like that.
Now, I came to my senses and I did what I felt was right. Obviously, Connor couldn't speak, but I felt like I had to say something. Hi, Connor. I'm your dad. I've been rubbish until now. So, rubbish, but it's gonna change. As long as your mum says it's okay, I'm gonna come around as much as I can. I promise. He stopped that little soliloquy by vomiting all over my chest. <laughs> <laughs> Michaela had to sit on the stairs, she was laughing so hard. Even Kim cracked a fucking smile. Kim took Connor upstairs to clean him up. Michaela asked if I wanted a cup of tea. It wasn't exactly the Forrest Gump movie moment I had in my head, but standing in a hallway with vomit all over my chest, I feel like I got off pretty easy. He said he was sorry. He was so upset. Maybe it was the drink, but it was so unlike him. As soon as it hit me, he said he was sorry. He said it wouldn't happen again. Promised. But it did. Voting's really important to me. Because, you know, politics is. I remember my mum telling me about all those women who'd, you know, shackle themselves and starve themselves, you know, even kill themselves so that one day I'd have the right to vote. And, yeah. I just remember that, that election day so clearly. First election where I actually got to vote. You know, not just tell my brother who to vote for because he hasn't got a clue or, you know, just share stuff on social media. Like, this was the first time I was able to mark the ballot and, and vote for myself. You know, after I did, I was, I was just I was so elated and excited and I just remember later that night when all the votes start coming in and I just felt deflated. You know, I woke up the next morning, I thought it was like a dream, but no, no. There's the news, scrolling up my news feed. I felt sick. Like I just didn't understand it. There were just, there were so many key people supporting it. So much evidence and just doesn't make sense. Like, how could the majority of my country have voted that way? Look, I don't expect to be on the winning side every time. Once would be nice. You know, make me feel like I live in a world that's like caring and kind and... Honestly, it just made me feel Hopeless. I forgot that I'd never sworn in front of my mum. <laughs> I lost a whole evening's worth of work when my laptop broke down. 
it was a valid reason to be upset, but maybe cunt, <laughs> fuck, bastard, bitch, dick wasn't the best way of showing it. <laughs> it was the worst joke I've ever heard. It wasn't even funny. Well, no, it was funny, but I heard it at a time where I shouldn't have been laughing. It was the day after my mum's funeral and I was just scrolling through Facebook looking at the endless posts of people saying they were there for me. Okay, Lisa, you used to call me names behind my back in school, but now you want me to know that you're there for me. Great. Cool. Thanks. Anyway, not the point. So, it was on this music page that I had liked. Doctor, doctor, I can't stop singing What's New Pussycat? It sounds like you have Tom Jones disease. <gasps> Is it rare? It's not unusual. <laughs> <laughs> right? Awful. Anyway, I couldn't help myself. I pissed myself laughing. I was actually laughing out loud. I think I was more laughing at myself for finding such a ridiculous joke funny. It just made me think of something that Mum would have seen and she'd have called me up from work just to tell me. She loved puns. And once I stopped myself chuckling away, I realised it was the first time I'd laughed in days. It was the first time I'd laughed since my mum died. I was horrified with myself. My mum had just died, I should have been a wreck at all times. But the more I thought about it and thought about mum and her awful sense of humour, I realised she wouldn't want me to be like that. Not finding happiness in anything. I had to find happiness for myself and for my dad. Laughter's good even if it is a truly awful Tom Jones puns. First time I went to the doctors. The first time I realised I wasn't doing so well. The first time I overdosed. First time I attempted suicide. Depression. It's like drowning. You're in the water and you're kicking your arms and your legs, but you're still sinking. You can't concentrate on anything else except all this water. All this water that's crashing over your head and pulling you down. kicking your arms and your legs, but you get tired and you're not getting anywhere. And you start to sink. Next to you, there's loads of people in a boat and they're telling you, just swim. It's not hard, just, just try and stay above the water, just swim. And you try. You try to swim and try to remember how to breathe, but your brain just isn't working and you can't. There's another boat as well. People in that boat are telling you, one day you'll learn how to swim. You can't yet, but if you keep trying, you'll get it. You'll stop drowning. They mean well, but they just don't get it. If I don't learn how to swim now, then I won't need to in the future. Because I'll drown now. I'm drowning.
the first time I caught myself was after school one day. Stolen a pair of scissors from art and I cut three deep lines into my right arm. It hurt. It bled, but not a lot. And I cried. Because telling people in a boat that you can't swim is almost impossible. But they seem to notice when you bleed. An actual wound that stops you from being able to swim. He carried on for a while. Until somebody threw me a ring on a rope. A rope that I couldn't cut. And they slowly helped me onto the boat. But there are still people out there drowning. Still people trying to bleed. And to get the real attention of those on the boats. <laughs>